Happy Sabbath, everyone. Very, very happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning and to encourage us as we uh, be going into this um, conflict. Um, the, the topic, the underlying conflict, cause of conflicts. And before we go into this uh, presentation, I will be going for a word of silent prayer as I ask you also to pray where you are. Amen. Again, we say happy Sabbath. This morning we have a very important topic here which we will be presenting at this time. It's called the underlying cause of conflicts. Conflicts, the word conflict, it appears in this prayer prophecy 2,383 times. And apparently, Jesus foreseen that conflicts would be in the world, and not only in the world, but even among his followers, even among his disciples. So in the book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 32, the Bible says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What is it? He said we are to fear not. Why? Because it is your father's pleasure to give you his kingdom. And if we should take a, a review or a census on the number of conflicts that are worldwide, we will see that there are millions of conflicts that are going on around the world. We have conflict among nations, we have conflict among churches, we have conflict among individuals, we have conflict even in the home. And so therefore, this morning I would like to address, or uh, to bring us to a realization as to how we can cope with conflicts. So, the question which I would like to present to, to us this morning are you standing firmly on the side of truth in this, in this crisis? So in this crisis, we need to be standing firmly on truth. In volume 5 of his testimony, page 136, the servant of the Lord had these words to pen to say to us. And I read it. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his laws are most despised, then our zeal should be warmest and our courage firm and courage and firmness the most unflinching to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. To fight in the battle of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our test. When? When champions are few. When majority has forsaken us. He goes on to say at this time, we must gather calm, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others and courage from cowardice and loyalty from their treason. So what are we to be doing? Gather warmth from others. So we know that we are standing on the very brink of crisis, religious crisis, otherwise. And so therefore, we as God's people, we need to be totally on the Lord's side. And how do we, how can we be sure that we are loyal to God? It is by keeping His commandment. In John 14, He said, If you love me, you will keep my commandment. So, how do we know that we are keeping God's commandment? And is there 
something that we need to do in order to show that we are keeping God's commandment. It says, a refusal to obey the commandment of God and a determination to cherish heart hatred against those who proclaim these commandments will lead to the most de determined war on the part of a dragon. Those whose whole energies are brought to bear against the commandment keeping people. So we cannot in any wise show that we have any allegiance or any defiance against God's word, against God, especially his commandment. Why? Because in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, we will read Revelation 12 verse 17, the Bible says, And the dragon was wroth with a woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what is the dragon doing? The dragon is making war with the remnant of her seed. Who does what? Who keep the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So as God's remnant commandment keeping people, we need to be united together. We need to be on, on, on one accord with each other. Why? Because the enemy is at war with us. You know, the servant of the Lord says that one of the things that will cause a conflict among our gays, Sabbath keeping people, is when we have the Sunday law movement. When this nation or uh, this country will cause our movement to change the law, the day of rest, then that will be a conflict for God's commandment keeping people. You see, the sun of movement is not making its way in darkness. The sun of movement. The leaders are concealing the true issue. Many who unite in, this, in the movement do not themselves see whether the undercurrent trending is, is the undercurrent trending. So what is happening here, brethren? The Sunday movement, even some of those who are in the Sunday movement, they are not even aware that they are working on Satan's side. Is profession or mild and apparent Christian, apparently Christian. But when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of the drug. <coughs> when this nation will speak against God's commandment people, then it will reveal its purpose that it is working with the dragon with Satan. So at this time, brethren, this is no time to compromise with truth. Now is not a time to compromise with truth. Why is it so? Why do we need to be standing firmly on the side of truth and righteousness? We run Herald, December 6, 1892, paragraph 1. The servant of the Lord says, We are pressing to the final conflict. What did he say, brethren? We are pressing to the final conflict. And in this, no time to compromise. Let no one turn traitor. It is no time to lay down or conceal our weapons and 
gives Satan an advantage in the warfare. So we cannot conceal our weapon. We cannot lay down our weapon because in doing so we are showing we are showing the enemy that we are conceiving and we are being we will be an, will be on his side. You will not stand true to your captain. If we conceal our weapon, then we will not, we will not stand true to our captain. Call to your fellow watchman, crying, the morning cometh, and the night also. So we need to see each other as watchmen on the wall of Zion. And then we need to be calling to each other to encourage each other that the more the, the morning coming and also the night. What is night? Night is untrue. Night is error. And so therefore, we are children of the light. Another important statement here we can read from manuscript number 152. 1897 it is no time to, to relax our effort to become dull and spiritless brethren we cannot at this time relax our effort or, or to become dull and spiritless no time to hide our light under a bushel to speak smooth things to prophesy deceit. Every power is to be employed for God. How much? Every power is to be employed for God. You are to maintain your allegiance, bearing the testimony for God and for the truth. Do you agree with me? We are to what? To, we are to bear the testimony and our allegiance for God. We cannot afford to compromise. There is a living issue before us of vital importance to the remnant people of God and to, every, and to the very close, close of the earth's history. For eternal interests are here involved. Brethren, we realize that the son of the law, that this corona by pan, uh, can, pan, can, pandemic is not something which is fully revealed as to what it's all about. But as we realize, we see then that the servant of the law said that on the very eve of the crisis, it is no time to, it is no time to be found without an evil heart or unbelief or departing from the living, God, living word. So who will prevail in this crisis? Who will prevail? Here are some words from the script, from the, from the script prophecy in Acts of the Apostle, page 431, paragraph 2. Say, God desires his people to prepare for the soon coming crisis. Prepared or unprepared, they must meet it. And those only who have brought their lives in conformity to divine standard will stand firm that the time of trial is. So, brethren, what he says here? Those who will stand firmly for the time of trial will be able to prevail. And so therefore, when darkness is deepest, the light of godly character will shine brightest. So when the light, when the darkness is deepest, the light of godlike character will shine the brightest. Would you say then that we are in a time of darkness? Would you say that this prevailing crisis that we have here is a form of darkness? Then if it is a form of darkness, then it is time for God's people to shine more. 
So then the question, brethren, is, are we in the last crisis? Are we in the last crisis? General Conference Bulletin, March 2nd, 1899, paragraph 1 says, the last great conflict will be short and terrible. Old controversies will be revived. New controversies will arise. The last warning, the last warning, there, there is a special power in the, in, the, um, in the presentation of the truth and the time. But how long, but how long will it continue? Only a little while. For only a little while. In every, in every, if ever there was a crisis, it is not. Brethren, if there was ever a crisis, it is what? It is not. And we realize that we are in this crisis, and that in the crisis is not. The Apostle John says in John 7 verse 17, Shall not God avenge his, his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he be alone with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Brethren, Jesus promised that though that he will avenge those who are, are making, those who are interfering, those who are, are put in a, a, a crisis upon his people, he will intervene. So in Luke 18 verse 7, he says, shall, shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him? Though he be alone with them, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. So even though it might delay, the servant will also say, he will avenge them how? He will avenge them speedily. He will avenge them speedily. Right? <clears throat> now, in the in Hebrew, chapter 10, verse 35 to 37, is a, is a promise to us. Hebrew chapter 10, verse 35 to 37 is a promise to all of us. It says, Cast not therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have, been, after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. So don't cast away your confidence. Don't cast away your, your confidence to fear, knowing that God promises that if you hold fast your faith or your confidence in Him and be with patience, He will fulfill His promise. So we are asked, brethren, to be patient. But can we can we be patient in a conflict? Can we be, be patient when there is a crisis? Yes, brethren, we can. The Apostle James says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth. Behold what? The husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth. Who is his husband now? Yes, it is Jesus. And he is what? Waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. And has long patience for it. Until you have received the early and the latter rain. Be therefore patient. Establish your heart for the coming of the Lord your night. So what, brethren? We are to be patient for what? And be established in, to be settled for the coming of the Lord joy night. So fear not. 
little frog. Fear not, little frog. Long does justice wait for mercy. <coughs> Long does justice wait for mercy to plead for the sinners. Therefore, you and I, we have a work to do. We are to be patient, patiently going door by door, step by step with whomever we can find to remind them or to encourage them in the crisis because it says that justice waited long for mercy. One day, justice will stand up and mercy will say no more. So we have been reminded now in Christ of the Blessing, page 177, paragraph 4, Christ of the Blessing, page 177, paragraph 4, say, the long suffering of God is wonderful. Amen? Long does justice wait while mercy plea with sinners. The bridegroom, sorry, the, the brightness and the judgment are established of his throne. As in the margin, the Lord is slow to anger, but he is a great power and will not in all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and in the clouds and the dust of his feet. So when we see many things are going on around us, tornadoes, the Lord sometimes have his ways in these things. So, it, it, so when we are in the time, brethren, of this waiting time, we are to remember that we are virgins. And the ten virgins, there were ten virgins, as we recall in Matthew 25, 1 to 13, that five of the virgins were Ten of the, the ten virgins, they all have the lamps and they all have oil. And as time went along, we realized that the, the, the oil went out. And then, at midnight, there was a cry. There was a cry at midnight. And in, and in Christ, Abbey Pleasant, page 412, paragraph 2 says, the ten virgins are watching in the evening of, the, of this earth history. All claim to be Christian. All have a call, a name, a lamp. All profess to be doing God's service. All apparently wait for, for Christ appearing. But five are unready. Five are what? Five are unready. Are you among the unready ones? Right? Five will be found surprised. <coughs> Sorry. This may and outside the banquet hall. Why? Five. Why five will be found outside the banquet hall? Is your lamp? Is your lamp? Empty or is it full? Is your lamp empty or is it full? You know, in Psalm 105, Psalm 119, verse 105, they say, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So is your lamp burning steadily? Christ of the place of page 413, for God who said, We cannot be ready to meet the Lord by walking when the cry is heard. We cannot be ready to meet the Lord when by waking when the cry is heard. We must be awake before the cry is heard. Behold the bridegroom coming and then gathering up our empty lamps to have them replenished. So we cannot wait for the cry to come. Then we try to go and replenish our lives with oil. We cannot keep Christ from our lives here and yet 
be a fit fit for companionship in heaven. We cannot put Christ to the side and then we are expecting to be companion with Christ in heaven. We cannot do that perfect. You know, Elijah, the prophet Elijah, he had a situation where in the school of a prophet, they were, where they were they, he faced a crisis. And what was Elijah's, Elijah's crisis? And how did Elijah respond to this crisis? In 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 12 to 13, 2 Kings 6 verse 12 to 13 said, And one of his servants said, Not my Lord, but O King Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the word that thou speakest in thy chamber. So sometimes we speak things in, in, in darkness or under a hidden situation, but the Holy Spirit is there to reveal these things to us. And in verse 13, it goes on to say, and he said, go and spy where he is. So he was sending them to go and spy where Elijah was. And it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Nathan. So here we see that they were trying to conspire against Elijah. They were trying to, dis to destroy Elisha. But what did God, how did God help Elisha? He goes on to say in the next verse, verse 14, Therefore sent he hither, thither, horses, and chariot, and, great house, and a great house. And they came by night, and they compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, and gone forth, behold, a house compassed the city, both horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my, my master, how shall we do? How shall we do? Verse 16, And he answered and answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they be with them. So what he say here, brother? Fear not, because they who are with us are more than they who are against us. In this time, brethren, of, of this uh, pandemic, in this time of this crisis of the, for the coronavirus, our God is closer and nearer to us. Because let's look at the continue the way that Elijah perceived that God was with him. Even though, even though Samaria was all surrounding uh, around him, but he was con confident that the Lord was working with him. So in verse 17, and Elijah prayed, to brethren, when we have a crisis, our greatest weapon is what? Is a prayer. How often are you praying? How often did Daniel pray? Daniel prayed three times a day. So he was see. In order for Elijah, Elijah to meet the crisis, what did he do? He prayed. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of his young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and fire around about Elijah. What a beautiful scene it is. So here we are, how the Samaria, Samaritan were surrounding Elisha. And so therefore, the, the, the student of the school of the prophet, they were fearful. And Elijah, being a man of faith, Elijah, being a man of faith, what did he say? Lord, open their eyes that they may see. And in verse 18, and when they came down to him, Elijah prayed unto the Lord and smite the people. Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elijah. 
So brethren, here Elisha prayed for, the, for his enemy to be smitten with, smitten with blindness. Did the Lord answer Elisha? Oh yes! Immediately the Lord answered Elisha and he smoothed them with, with their blindness. Right? Now, after they were being smitten with blindness, what did God do next? He sent them. He said, verse 19, And Elijah said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this is a city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But, but, led by to Smyrna. But he led them rather to Smyrna. To some area. So here, brethren, we see that even though Elijah, Elisha was encompassed by many chariots, right? And the, his fellow students become very fearful. But what did the Lord say? We, we want, Lord, put blindness upon these men, upon these people. And Elisha took them down. And in verse 20, the same chapter, and it came to pass when they came to Samaria that Elijah said, Lord, open their eyes. Open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their, their eyes and they saw and behold, they were in the midst And behold, and they opened their eyes, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, When he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? You know, can you or should you take disadvantage of a man who you have, who you have already controlled? But what is Elijah says? He said, no, set bread before them, feed them. You know, the Jesus in Mark, he said, if your enemy is hungry, what should you do? Feed the enemy. If your enemy is at thirst, what should you do? Give him to drink. And so therefore, we see that brethren that God gave Elisha compassion and his enemies, and then he released them. So, never fail to remember that God is protecting us. Do you believe that? Right? Protected by God's own army. <clears throat> so, in these last ages, Sister White is giving uh, a narration or an illustration of what took place here with Elisha. This is Acts 82, 40, paragraph 2 says, So the angel protected Lot and led him safely from the midst of Sodom. Right? So they protected Elisha in the battle, in the, in the, in the little mountain city. When the encircling hill were filled with the horses and the chariot of king of Syria and the great host of his armed Elisha, they held the near hill slope and covered with the angel of God and horses and chariots and fire was above the Lord. So he saw that they were there covered with fire and chariot and Elijah did not want to take disadvantage of the situation but he prayed for them and the Lord was able to control these warriors with blindness and not only that but Elijah was able to lead them safely down the mountain from where they came and to say this is the place where you are you pay your name so do you know that God has mighty angels to protect us? Do you know that God has mighty angels to protect us? In these last ages, page 230, paragraph 3, we read, So the angel protected Lot 
and led him all safely from the midst of Sodom. So we know the situation that was going on with Sodom and how the Lord in his mercy has sent out angels to encourage Lot and his, and his family to flee out of um, Sodom. And so the, the, the same miracle that Lot experienced was being experienced here by Elisha. So they protected Elisha in the little mountain city when the encircling hill were filled with the horses and the chariot of the king of, Samaria, of Syria and the great house of his armed men, Elijah beheld the nearer the hill slope covered with the armies of God. Horses and chariots and fire run about the servant of the Lord. Wouldn't you like to experience such a situation, brethren? where the Lord sent out his chariot, his angel, to protect us. You know, when you read in Psalm 117, sorry, in Psalm 68 and verse 17, he said that the, the chariots of God are thousands, even twenty thousands of angels. So we know that the, the, the word chariot here in the reference is referring to nothing than the angel. So do you know that God angel protects us also? God angels also protect us. And, and this is something that we don't want at any time to be out of God's protection. This is page, the next paragraph in this half page, 240 paragraph 3 says, So in all ages, angels have been near to Christ, faithful followers. So in, in spite of this pandemic situation that, and the, that is going on around the world, God's angels are, are protecting us. Psalm 91 said that, that, I mean, we shall dwell in he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So we are being protected, brethren. He goes on to say in his half ages, the vast confederacy of evil is arrayed against all who would overcome. But Christ would have us look to the things which are not seen to the armies of heaven encamp about all who love God and, del and to deliver them. From what danger, seen and unseen, we have been, we have been preserved through the inter interposition of angels who shall never know, who we shall never know until the light of eternity we see the providence of God. So some of our situation, we will never see until we get to heaven, when we will be able to see the things. He goes on to say that, then, shall we, then we shall know that the whole family of heaven is interested in the family here below, and that the messengers from the throne of God are tending our Steps from day to day. Our the, the angels are attending our step from day to day. So Asa trust God. Asa he trusted God. Another situation. We find Elisha trusted God. And here so we also find yeah, Asa or Asa trusted God. Second Chronicles chapter 14. <coughs> And verse 11, Second Chronicles 14 verse 11 says, And Asa cried unto the Lord, his, his God, and said, Lord, it is not nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them 
that have no power. Help us, O oh God, for we rest on thee. And in thy name we go against this multitude. In thy name we will go against this coronavirus. O oh Lord, thou art our oh God, let no man prevail against thee. So this is a, the, the, the encouragement that we can have from Asa and his experience can be our very experience today. Wouldn't you like to have that experience? <coughs> so how much faith does here Asa have? Or uh, where was Asa's faith? Brethren, where are your faith? Where is your faith today? The faith of Asa was put to severe, a severe test when Zebra, the Ethiopian, with a with an house of a thousand thousand, three hundred chariots, brethren, a thousand thousand is a million. Three hundred chariot invaded his kingdom. In this crisis, Asa did not put his trust in the fenced city of Judah that he had built with the walls and with the tower and the gates and the bars, nor in the mighty men of Vanguard. His careful trained army, the king's trust was in Jehovah of hosts. Who was the king? The king's trust was in Jehovah of hosts. Setting his fears in the battle array, he sought the help of God. So, in every crisis, we must see God as our very help. In every crisis, we see throughout the Bible that those who were close to God, those who were mighty to our mighty men in the word of God, they all were put their trust in God. We could name Joshua, we could name Joseph, we could name Moses, we could name Daniel, and all these men, they put their trust and confidence in God. Who are you trusting into the brethren? So in this time of crisis, in this time of crisis, are you in amusement? Brethren, if we are not on our knees, if we are not studying the word of God and on our knees praying and weeping, pleading with God for help, then this crisis will overcome us. So we should never find any time or any amusement in this time. Why? Let's read here. Christ of the Blessing. It says in Encouraging and Conflict, page 203, paragraph 3, the opposing armies now stood face to face. It was a time of test and trial to those who served the Lord. Had every sin been confessed? Had the men of Judah full confidence in God's power to deliver? Such thought as these were in the minds of the leaders from every human viewpoint, the vast house of Israel would sweep everything before it. But in the time of peace, Asa had not been given himself into amusement and pleasure. He had been preparing for the for an emergency. He had an army trained for conflict. He had endeavored to lead his people to make their peace with God. 
And now, although his forces were fewer in number than the enemy, his faith in the, in the one whom he had made his trust did not weaken. And how did it all come, to, come together? He had no time for amusement. He had been given into prayer. He had been prepared for the emergency. And how do we prepare for the emergency, even those that we, that we should have bought, which is ahead of us? We need, brethren, to be in prayer, just like he was in this time. <clears throat> So where is your strength? Or, or we would say, who is your strength? In 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 12, it says, Our God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do. But our eyes are upon thee, Lord, our eyes in this pandemic situation, in this covert um, situation which is going around us, our eyes, Lord, are upon you. Not upon men, not upon the, not upon the things which are going, but upon you. So we, we will love to have, we must always try, brethren, to have God as our God, let him be our strength. Let our eyes be upon him. Are you a man or a woman or a child of courage? Do you have courage? Where is your, where is your courage? Where do you place your courage? Prophet and Kings, page 198, paragraph 4, says, the servant, the servant of the Lord says, <clears throat> Toward the close of Jehoshaphat's reign, the king of Judah was invaded by an army whose approach the inhabitants of the land had reason to, to tremble. Jehoshaphat was a man of courage and valor. For years he had been strengthening his army and his fortified city. He was well prepared to meet any foe, yet in the crisis he put his trust in the arm. He put, yet in the crisis he put not his trust in the in any army of flesh, not in the disciplined army of fenced city, but in the living God. So he said his trust was in the living God. His trust was in the living God. So brethren, when the final conflict comes, how would we, how would your life approach that conflict? Prophet 352 says, paragraph 2, the long expected crisis finally came. The forces of Assyria Advancing from, from the from advancing from triumph to triumph appeared to Judah. Judah's only hope was now in God. All possible help from Egypt had been cut off. So brethren, where are you looking for your help? Those that were he was looking for from Egypt were cut off. Right? And so therefore. He had was to look to God. What did the king of Judah do when he received this threat? What did he do when he received this threat? When the king of Judah received the, the, the taunting letter, he took it into the temple and spread it before the Lord. So when we see situation that comes uh, to, what, to us, where are we putting our trust? How do we approach God? How are we approaching the Lord in our time when we are helpless? Let's see what I'm 
the king of Judah did. He goes on to say, brethren, again I read, when the king of Judah received the taunting letter, he took it into the temple and spread it before the Lord and prayed with strong faith for help from, from heaven that the nation of earth might not that the, that the nation of earth might know that God is of the Hebrews still live and reign. Honor the honor of Jehovah was at stake. He alone could bring deliverance. So brethren, when our heart when our situation become endangered, become compromised, then we need to look to God for help. When Hezekiah was in deep crisis, the Lord said, Isaiah, when you and I are in deep crisis, the Lord will send angels to us, to our angels and assist us. Reverend King page 359 paragraph 2 says, Hezekiah was not left without hope. <clears throat> Isaiah sent to him, saying, Thus said the Lord, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, that which thou hast prayed this night against um, Sennacherib, king of, um, of Assyria, I have heard that the very night deliverance came. The angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyria an hundred four score and five thousand. So when Hezekiah was praying, he said the angel of the Lord sent hope to a Hezekiah from he thrown through Isaiah to the king. And it says that over the angel of the Lord went out and smote the camp of, uh, of the Assyrian and hundred, four score and five thousand. So in, when we are in our crisis, brethren, the Lord will stand for us. He will stand for us. So what about our, our time now, brethren? <clears throat> what about this time when you and I are living in this final crisis? So here we have seen how the Lord had helped ancient Israel. But what about you and I at this time? In Revelation 12 and verse 17, it says that the dragon was wrought with a woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandment of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. So you and I, brethren, will feel the irony of the dragon. <clears throat> and how should we approach our crisis in our time? One of eight of the testimony, page 117, says, Our refusal to obey the commandment of God and a determination to church hatred against those who proclaim these commandments lead to the most determined war on the part of the dragon whose whole energies are brought to bear again the commandment keeping people of God. So brethren, if when we are refusal to obey the commandment of God, we are cherishing hatred against the commandment of God and we are endorsing are lifting up the devil. And he said it leads to the most determined war on the part of the drug. So you and I, brethren, we cannot in any way have any association with those who are have an evil heart against the commandment of God. And when we as we are coming to the close here, brethren, we realize that the angel of the Lord Those who were being slain in the dark ages, the angel of the Lord 
Mark, uh, the, the Holy Spirit have marked or penned this word in, the, in this fashion. Revelation 6 and verse 11. And white words were given to every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest. Yet for a little season until their fellow servant also and their brethren that they should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. What it says here? The white robes were given to every one of them as it was unto, as it was said unto them, that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servant and their brethren that they should be killed as they, as they were should be fulfilled. So you and I brethren, in this crisis, the crisis ahead of us, we will be killed. But we are not to become fearful because he said we are, that those who have been killed were have been given white robes. Are you waiting or are you Praying asking the Lord to close you with this white robe. And what is this white robe? What is this white robe? It is nothing than the righteousness of Christ. Let's read here, brethren. He said, Who will wear the white robe? Who will the white robe be given to? Uh, we turn to verse page 665, paragraph 2. It says, their warfare is ended. Their victory won. They have run the race and reached the prize. Have you and I, have we run the race? Have we received the prize? Not yet. He said, the palm branches in their hands is a symbol of their triumph. The white robe is an emblem of their spotless righteousness of Christ which now is there. Again, let me read it. They have run the race reached the price. The palm branch in their hands is a symbol of their triumph. The white robe is an emblem of their spotless righteousness of the spotless righteousness of Christ which now is theirs. So they have received it, but you and I, brethren, we are still, uh, we are still awaiting for the white robe which Christ will give us. So in Revelation chapter 13, Revelation 13, we see that there are two beasts. The first beast was the one who came up from the water, and his second beast was the one who came up from the earth. So in Revelation 13, we're, we're going to read here about the second beast. And this second beast will put God's people in a crisis. But how will you not manage, or how will, will you not be able to go through the crisis? Will we go through it triumphantly with Christ leading us? Are we our or are we going to try to do it by ourselves? It says in Revelation 20, verse 14, and he deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he has power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by his sword and, and his lip. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as, as many as who would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. That you and I are with. Or as many as who refuse the image of the beast, what we should be, we should be killed. And those who were in the dark ages, and because they have refused their allegiance to the papacy, they have been killed. Over 600 million people were being killed in the dark ages. Who we have just read about in, Re in Re Revelation chapter 6. So here, in our time, this is 
what will happen to us. You and I are perfect. And what situation will those who honor God cause God have to face in the near future? Let's read in, in, uh, in, in Mark 13. What are some of the things we're going to see there as we, as we go through this? Um, in, in, um, in, in Mark 13. What are the, what are the, the, the scriptures here? Say, brother, that those who will go through the situation here. So in Mark chapter 13 and verse 9, Mark 13 and verse 9, he says, But take heed unto yourself, but take heed unto yourself, for they which for they shall deliver you up to the council and in the synagogue, and he shall be beaten, and he shall be brought before the rulers of the kings of the, of the kings for for this for for my sake for the testimony against them. So what does it say here? We shall be brought again. What does it say here, brethren? In verse nine, Mark thirteen and verse nine. What does the Bible say here? It says that. But take heed to yourself. For they shall deliver you up to the councils, and in the synagogue, and in and he shall be beaten, and he shall be brought before the rulers <coughs> and the king, uh, and the rulers of the and the kings for my sake, for the testimony against them. So in the future, brethren, you and I will be brought before the, the rulers and the king. So those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be, demand, will be denounced as the enemies of the law and order. You and I, brethren, because we love the Bible, because we obey God's Bible, we will be brought before, he said that, those who honor the Bible will be denounced as enemy of law and order. As breaking down the moral restraint of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgment of God on the earth. Their, con their conscientious scruples will be, pro will be pronounced obstinacy, stubbornness, and contempt of authority. So we will be looked upon it as being what? Stubborn. With stubbornness and contempt of, our, of authority, they will be accused as disaffection towards the government. Minister who deny the obligation of the divine law will present will present from the pulpit the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authority as ordained of God. So we will be obedient to the civil authority who have been ordained of, of God. Brethren. So this is a mighty time in which we are living here. Again I read, those who honor the Bible will, de will be denounced as enemies of the law and order. As breaking down the moral restraint of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgment of God upon the earth, upon the earth, their conscientious scruples will be de will be de will be pronounced obstinacy, stubbornness, and contempt of authority. They will be accused of dis disaffection towards the government. Ministers who deny the obligation of the divine law will present. To the people, to the public rather, the duty of yield to obedience to the civil authority. And in conclusion, brethren, in conclusion, he says that as Protestant churches re reject the clear scriptural argument in defense of God's law, they will long in, they will long to silence those who have faith. They cannot overthrow by the Bible. Let me read again. We're going to verse page 592. As the Protestant churches reject 
the clear scriptural argument in defense of God's law, they will learn to silence those who are, whose faith they cannot overthrow that by the Bible. Though they blind their eyes to the fact they are now adopting a course which will lead to the persecution of those who conscientiously refuse to do that, to do what rest of the Christian world are doing and acknowledge the claim of the papal Sabbath. So brethren, we cannot in any way follow those who are perpetually breaking the law of God. And as a result, you and I will be persecuted. You and I will be looked upon as troublemakers. Why? Because we, 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 are, we, we are refusing. We refuse to, to put away the thus said the Lord, to put, in, or to put away the Bible, and to follow thus said the man. We cannot do this in this crisis present. So, as we conclude then, the question is, are you ready to die for the truth? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you ready to die for the truth? Are you ready to stand on the platform of the truth? Are you ready when the crisis come that you will say, I would rather obey God than man. I would rather to die for the truth than to yield one inch to something which will go against God's law. May the Lord help us that as we go through this crisis, we will take the, the, the situation there that we have, which we saw with Asa. We will take the courage that we saw with Elisha. Elisha saw all these chariots and the mountain. And as his servant saw the, the, the chariot and they were afraid, what did they do? They, what they did they do? They went and Elijah said, let's pray. And Elijah told the Lord, open their eyes that they may see. And when the eyes of these people, these men were opened, what did they see? They see the whole mountain was covered by the, by the army of God. You and I, when we come to the crisis in our time, we need to say, Lord, open our eyes that we may see that we are one just for and by so doing, we will say, Lord, no, I'm ready to walk with you. I'm ready to die for the scripture. But let us not be presumptuous like the apostle Peter and deny the Lord. But let us say, I can do all things through Christ who is threatening us. I would like to read this uh, final thought here. He says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, And all that will live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. May the Lord help us. Invite you to kneel with, kneel with us as we, as I will pray, and ask the Lord to give us courage in this time of crisis, that we will have the faith of Jesus, we will have the faith of Daniel, we have the faith of so many of these men, who have gone through uh, terrible time. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for the time which we are able to spend here, Lord, in your word. And we pray that you might bless those who are listening to the word that you are presenting to, through me. Lord, help that the word will not be my word, but they will be the word that comes from your throne. Give us courage. Help us to have strong faith. Even in this time of crisis, we pray in your name. Amen.